All right. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this event by the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Angel. I'm the center's coordinator, and I will also be um, today's moderator. Now, more importantly, today's speaker sitting to my right. It's Matthias Slavov with the topic um, Metaphysics of Time Lurking Within Historiography, Considering the Equal Existence of Past, Present, and Future, and equal is in parentheses. Now, um, Matthias is at the moment a lecturer in philosophy at our very own University of Oulu. So he's our dear colleague here. Most of you probably know him. Um, so we are very happy to have him. But even better, we are even more happy because of the topic, because um, the philosophy of history and the philosophy of time didn't have a lot, lot of interaction so far, but at least today, it looks like this will change. And of course, there should be some interaction, maybe even overlap, because both at least talk about past time, the past, in one way or another. So Now, um, uh, Mati Matthias' main research interests lie in the philosophy of time. I think he would even consider himself a philosopher of time, but he might um, um, correct me on this. On David Hume and uh, the history and philosophy of science. Now, Matthias' most recent publications in these fields, I want to name a few of, of them for you, are uh, Mach's Denial of Absolute Time, which came out with History of Philosophy Quarterly last year, 2023. And also um, Eternalism and the Problem of Hyperplanes, which was published in the journal Ratio or Ratio uh, in 2022. Also, um, Matthias has published two books on his most research interests in the last years. One of them on the philosophy of time is called Relational Passage of Time, which also came out in 2023 with Routledge. And another one is called Hume's Natural Philosophy and the Philosophy of Physical Science, which came out with Bloomsbury Academic in 2020. Now, um, this is the third session of our um, third and uh, penultimate session of our spring seminar 2024. After today, we will have one more talk. Um, on May 28, we will have Seth Guidoan from the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa in Italy, speaking on um, in between Hegel and Marx, Gramsci's Storicismo Assoluto. Apparently, this is absolute historicism. Um, this event will also take place in hybrid format. So in this room, on a room very much like this, and on Zoom, because um, Seth Gidoan will be a visiting scholar in the end of May with us here in Oulu. But um, I have some good news for you. Um, this won't be the last event, uh, last of our events before the summer. Um, we have another talk outside of our seminar cycle. And it is already this month. Um, on April 29, we will have Taina Marino from the University of Poznan in Poland, who will be speaking on uh, empathy, intergenerational justice, and the ethics of history. And this event will also be hybrid, so like here, um, and because Hannah will also be a visiting scholar at the center for the, in, later on this month. Now, um, if you'd like to stay updated about our activities, please follow our social media channels. We have Facebook and X, formerly Twitter. Um, now, if you want to become a visiting scholar with us as Taina Marino and Seth Kido and are going to be very soon, please check out our homepage. We have all the information on there and I think we are very welcome to visit us. And finally, um, if you'd like to talk in our seminar, not, not in the spring session anymore, please also let us know. Um, our motto is after the seminar is before the seminar. So we already have first plans for this autumn seminar, but of course there are still um, slides, uh, uh, slots open if you would like to speak yourself. Now, finally, um, technicalities. I already said to online, I already forcibly muted you because we have a big speaker in the middle here to avoid disturbance, um, but no worries. You will be unmuted and liberated for a discussion session. And we'll have a discussion session right after um, uh, Matthias' talk, um, which I will moderate, especially for the online folk. Um, please um, indicate first the chat that you would like to speak, and then I will make a speaker's list, and we will alternate between the room and online in terms of questions and comments. All right, that was it for me. Thank you very much, Matthias. I just yeah, share the presentation. Thank you for accepting our invitation. If everything works, it works for us. I would assume it works online too. It's, this is okay. Thank you, Georg, for the very flattering introduction and for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, so I wasn't sure to begin with. Um, I was maybe a little bit hesitant about me giving talk in this seminar because really my field would be or is the metaphysics of time, which is about the general nature of time in the most, well, the most in the broadest and the most abstract sense, what is time? And so I'm not very practically inclined researcher in 
the, the study of history. Uh, let's see, this can we do? It? Okay, it should work well. Okay, so what I did, I quickly read uh, parts of the recent correspondence that was published in the Journal of the Philosophy of History. And there was some articles in, published in 2022 and some more recent articles. So they seem to center around realism about the past, our epistemic access to the past, and also uh, the ontological question about the existence of the past. But the way it seemed to me, it was more like a dialogue between realism and, and anti-realism and the, some of different varieties within these doctrines. But they didn't so much talk about uh, the general nature regarding time. There was this, the last article of which I think is quite recently published where there was a lot of, they actually mentioned Eternalism in that paper, the author, that's what you are, that you shared in the, the list. And there's going to be, after one week, there's going to be a reading circle on that paper. I, I was actually thinking of reading that paper closely and would like to attend that seminar in a week. So I think I can chime in and say something meaningful about that. Um, so what I found, again, this was a quick, uh, quick glance, they, they say, these articles, they, they say something that's relevant close or close to the metaphysics of time. So truth making across time, then there were some, some mentions about temporal becoming, how events come to be. Then there was something about the temporal asymmetry, direction of causation, how we think that causes precedes effects in time and what's the foundation of, of, of that. But they didn't so much uh, center around philosophy of time, they didn't so much assess the question of what, what is time. And it wasn't that clear to me that the others had a position on, on the general nature of time. And I'm not saying that they, they, they should have that. Uh, but, well, okay, so what I, I'm gonna do here in this talk, so I'm gonna, uh, go through the argument for what I find the most plausible metaphysics of time, uh, that is eternalism. And this is the view that predicates the existence of all times, past, present, and future, are all equally real according to eternalism. And then uh, some of these topics that were mentioned in the, the correspondence in the Journal for Philosophy of History, like through making and temporal passage, I'm gonna, gonna discuss these topics also. And well, what to expect? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not really in the historiography or uh, I don't have a, a settled position there, but how that would um, look like in that context, I think it's a, uh, ontologically realistically inclined position. So the idea is that in eternalism that the past as well as the future, but the future is not so relevant uh, today in this talk. Well, the past events, they really exist in one way and only they're fixed and propositions concerning past events, they have a definite truth value. So when we make statements concerning past events, uh, we can we are either objectively right or wrong about this past events. Uh, yeah, and I wish to. Well, I'm gonna start before getting to eternalism. I'm gonna start from from presentism. So here, what I have in the title is that so this is what common sense tells us. Uh, it seems in some, some way obvious that, well, only the, the, the present moment and the presently existing things, that's all there is. So for instance, we are in this room, we have a seminar, this is an event, that, that exists. But when you contrast that with the past and the future, how are past and the future different from the present, our existing here? 
Well, <laughs> they are different because they do not exist. So the past doesn't exist anymore. There are no dinosaurs fighting on Earth anymore. They were, but not anymore. They cease to exist. And the future, while it hasn't unfolded yet, it doesn't exist. So there are no Mars outposts at this moment. No one has yet walked, no human has yet walked on the surface of Mars. Uh, well, whether I want to be a little careful when I say that this is a commonsensical view, because in recent years there have been some uh, empirical studies, questionnaires. Um, so people have been, layman people have been asked uh, about the nature of time. And what I've seen studies in the United States and Italy, most respondents, they subscribe to roughly a presentist uh, view of time. So the majority view is, is presentist, but there was still a considerable minority who had different kinds of ideas closer to journalism or the growing block view. The growing block view would be the view that the, the present time and the past time exist, but the future doesn't, and the future is non-existent and open. Uh, and then the, there's also a question about how much, if this is the intuitive view, is it really uh, something that is intuitive for, for us who speak tensed language, our culture, whether all humans, all humans across cultures and times share this intuition. But I've looked up some um, the work in the philosophy of time, and it, it seems to suggest that this is mostly the commonsensical intuitive view for humans, that it is presentism. The present time exists, the past doesn't anymore, and future not yet. Well, um, now let's assume that that's the intuitive view, that's the maybe default position, and then let's look at this doctrine more closely. Okay, so only the present exists, that excludes the existence of past and future. Well, what that then means is that the present moment is the same everywhere in space. So the now, now here in this room, well, it has to be the same now as in other rooms here in this building, it has to be the same now as in other buildings and other cities, countries, planets, galaxies, anywhere you go in the universe, that moment now has to be the same. So in the physics parlance, one would say that there's, uh, there's a unique hyperplane of simultaneity that cuts throughout everything that exists. And that's really the measure of everything that exists like before that or after that, there's nothing. There's this one universal present plane and everything, all events are, uh, all events really according to presentism because all events are, uh, they take place in the present moment. There are no other times. So that the moment when we say that something happens, we don't need to say something happens now. It's kind of redundant to say now because everything happens in the present. So everything lines up with this one unique hyperplane of simultaneity. So simultaneity in presentism has to be absolute and completely universal. So everything that exists, uh, exists in the present moment. There are no other times than the present moment. So everything that exists, exists simultaneously independently of where we are in, uh, in space. And now another feature of presentism is that um, it's a dynamic theory of time. So when we think of tense, past, present, future, when we think of the now, the now is not like frozen or static. What is now, it doesn't remain the same at all times, right? But what is now has to somehow change. And this means uh, that time passes or flows. 
Now in the, the, the metaphysics of time discussions, when we talk about the passage of time, that has a very precise meaning. Uh, it, now we are not referring to, let's say the subjective experience of duration. So it's well known that uh, those kinds of experiences, for instance, if you think of uh, the Christmas Eve, when a little child is waiting for Santa Claus and the Christmas presents, as opposed to an elderly person, it's like it feels much more longer for the little child than for, for the older person. And uh, other, other examples are well-known cases like uh, when we are in a flow mood and enjoying, time seems to pass very quickly. When we are bored or um, uh, in pain or something, time seems to flow more slowly. So this is a, about subjective experience of, of, of the flow of time or passage of time. I don't think, I don't know anyone who would uh, deny the existence of this kind of experience of duration, if that counts as, as passage. But passage of time in these discussions means specifically that time has this kind of dynamic structure in which the future approaches, then it turns into now, and drifts off into the past. And well, what that has to mean under presentism is that the future, which is nothing, becomes the now, which is something. And then this now, which is something, then becomes non-existent, nothing, the past. So there is this one directional uh, change along the past, present, future axis. Well, so for the most part, we can say that this is a, a commonsensical view, but then now actually, can I open this link? Should it work? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, been, is it very necessary for you? Well, it, <laughs> I don't know, very necessary. Well, you can unshare the screen and then open it and share the other screen if that is. So what should it go outside of the space? Yeah, it's gone outside. You have to share that. Yeah, no, I quickly do it. But it's, it's a long recipe. Sorry. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. OK. Share that. Yeah, I can also like talk it through, but it's better if I see. Is this one right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, After that, I'll get I'll get back and light on things. See that? That one, yeah. And I think we're sharing. Yes. Okay. Then. Cool. Yes. Okay. So this is a uh, field papers uh, survey mm -hmm. about temporal mm -hmm. ontology. So professional philosophers are asked which is their preferred. Ontological commitment to time, growing block, eternalism, or presentism. <laughs> then, well, when we look at the answers, there are no explanations to these answers. But among the general philosophical population, while well, eternalism is seems to be the most um, accepted or preferable position, around forty percent, and then presentism and growing block view are uh, less than twenty percent. Uh, among the population. But now something interesting happens when you pick area of specialization. And we put here um, philosophy of physics, while well, eternalism gets over 50, but presentism, there's not a lean towards presentism is only 5%. So this, well, although there are no explanations to this or answers anything, like when you get into physics, it seems that presentism is. Let me know what's the population, how many people are. Uh, it should be 37. 37, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what was the, wait. And I didn't see philosophy of history. No, no, 734. Is, this is 734. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't uh, yeah, yeah. there. And then to get, mm. is this okay now? Do you know? I'm not sure if this is the chest. No, it's not. Probably need to be said. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Let's do it. They didn't take into account that 
filosofo já disse. Ah, uh, it's okay. I can, uh, it doesn't take many clicks to get back. Oh, no, you're okay. back. Now it should be good. Yes, cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, just, well, in general, why, why does it, see, why doesn't presentism go along with physics? So, well, one thing is when you look any, any theories or laws of physics, and there's one um, point made by Craig Callender that I like, it really doesn't matter if you look at Aristotelian or Cartesian or Newtonian or relativistic or quantum physics, like you really don't see any unique moment now, you don't see any reference to the moment now. So propositions concerning laws, they're typically differential equations and they don't make any reference to tense in any way. So it's like, if you compare that to calendars, so when you look calendars, well, it's like all days are spread out in the calendars, but the calendar doesn't tell you when, when it's now, when it's today. Uh, so with these differential equations, you can, uh, if we have instances like, let's say two body systems revolving around common center of mass, we can predict how the, how the two bodies will move this way in time or that way in time. We don't have any reference to direction of time. They are typically, these laws are symmetric uh, regarding time. There are some exceptions like the second law of thermodynamics and some other possible candidates. But what we certainly don't find in, in laws of physics is this kind of animation, this kind of dynamic structure of time, the, the flow, the passage of time from past via now to the future. Okay, and here now we get to uh, the argument for for eternalism and more um, detailed reasons why how eternalism becomes a credible doctrine. So, uh, in the both the special and general theories of relativity, we have time dilation, which is very well experimentally corroborated and documented. Uh, natural phenomenon. So uh, simply say we have one frame in which two events are simultaneous, then the temporal difference of those two events is zero. We have another frame, and then in general, the, the same two events in that frame are successive. So there's some positive, positive number we get out of the equations, the equation. And then we might have a third frame in which this uh, events are successive in the opposite order to the uh, to the second frame. So here maybe uh, some like sample events. What would be good? Usually it works better if we have something at the opposite sides of the room. But but let's say like um, turning off that TV and opening that door. So and let's say that for us who are at rest. These events are simultaneous. We have one observer moving toward the TV. That would start off first, that would come later, that would be in the future, and opposite to the third, third observer. So already now we have some kind of intuition that the present moment isn't universal. So uh, if things that are not causally connected, if they happen in different order to different observers, well then, one observers now can be others future and the third one past. So that all already gives some relativity and perspectival nature for the notions of past, present and future. Or just like the like gravitational time dilation, if you have a clock that's higher up than this clock here, they don't show the, the same time. So they don't, what is now here and what's now there is not the same. So you already get like a little bit the idea that, well, uh, there are mul multiple nows and what, what is now is not absolute as in present. So now we get to defining eternalism. Uh, in the tense sense, we can say 
that different times, past, present, and future are all real. So the uh, dinosaurs fighting on Earth, that's equally real for us being in this room and maybe people walking on Mars uh, someday. Every event from the, the start to the, the end, I don't know what, where it all started from and where it's going to end, but to use these expressions, Big Bang and heat death of the universe, everything in between, our births, our deaths, us being here, everything is equally real. And then whether something is past, present, or future depends on perspective in that we need to designate, designate the, the frame of reference. Um, here, well, there's one, uh, one exception would be the, the so-called moving spotlight view, which would be eternal at its background, but it would treat tense as absolute, but I'm going to, I'm going to skip that point. Okay, now, now to the argument for eternalism. Let's be a little more clear with uh, the terminology here. So when we assign reality values to events, well, for presentism, only the present events have reality value of one, past and future are zero. Eternalists uh, ascribe reality value to, to all events, past, present, and future. Okay, and now this, uh, the classical argument for eternalism uh, in the 1960s, Riedig and Putnam published uh, independently of each other two papers that are maybe the, or they are eternalist doctrine maybe has been around for a longer time, but this was like, these were explicit extended arguments for, for eternalism. Although not re, neither of the two used the term eternalism explicitly. And then we have some follow-ups in the 1980s by Maxwell and, and Penrose and 2010, there's one very good paper by Peterson Silverstein. So um, let's, let's be clear with the, the relevant concepts here. So uh, when we have events that possess the same reality value, they are related in terms of a reality relation. And that's marked with R. So if we have three, two or more events, or like here, three events, A, B, and C, they are equally real, then equal, A is equally real to B, B is uh, equally real to C. And then we have three conditions, reflexivity, symmetry condition, and transitivity. The first one is quite, obvious, this reflexivity. So uh, A is equally real to A, since, since A has a unique reality value. Uh, the symmetry condition is also pretty clear. If A is equally real to B, uh, then B is equally real to A, because we have the same reality value. But the last, last point is the most controversial, and this is also uh, people who criticize the classical argument, they typically uh, focus on the last point. So transitivity, uh, if A is equally real to B, and if B is equally real to C, then A and C are equally real. Well, in, in some simple mathematical cases, transitivity is unproblematic. If, if A is bigger than B and B bigger than C, then A is bigger than C. But you have other instances of transitivity, like if Andy is a friend of Becky and Becky is a friend of Cecilia, it doesn't follow that Andy is a friend of Cecilia. Uh, so it's not clear to begin with that this transitivity chain holds. Okay, but what we need, this is what we need for this classical argument. So we need to assume that distant events, events that are separated in space, not connected causally, that they are equally real. Events that are in each other's absolute elsewhere. If this assumption is correct, then simultaneous events are, are equally real. So here with this notation, uh, A being simultaneous with B should imply that A is equally real with C. And the same thing with, uh, with events mm -hmm. A and C. So now uh, here are two 
space time diagrams two observers one and two and in the frame of reference of one there's two space-like separated events a and b uh, they are simultaneous and then there's another uh, observer two and in their frame uh, the events a and c are simultaneous well, so those are the two premises that I just mentioned. So uh, A and B are simultaneous, and then A and C are simultaneous. Simultaneity is relative; it's not unique. So those those both can be true within their own frames of reference. Well, now if we add that the the premises three and four add that A is simultaneous with B implies that A is equally real. That would be, and then premise four A is simultaneous with C implies that A is equally real with C. Well, then we get the equal reality of A and B and A and C that should implies by transitivity that B is equally real with C. And now in this uh, this light cone, the C is in the future of B. So what this means is that a later event is equally real with an earlier event, an earlier event is equally real with a later event. Now let's stick with this to with the same events, uh, exactly the same events that we have in the uh, previous figure. And now let's say that we have an observer located at A at an event at A, and for them, the event A occurs now. C is in their future. Well, now we have another observer at event C. The event C occurs now for them, and A is in, in their past. And now we have, well, according to eternalism, all events exist unconditionally. So this is just, uh, this is not something that pops up, that just comes out uh, from nowhere. It, it's been there uh, eternally, but we have event D that we just didn't didn't mention previously. Um, okay, and let's say we have an observer at D. This event occurs now for an observer located at D. So the A would be in their past, C in their future. And now when we have an observer at A, they utter a statement, event D will occur, an observer at C, other sustainment event did, did, did occur. Well, if it's a some definite physical event, we would expect both statements to have a definite truth values. It would be weird if they didn't, because then it would be like, well, whether something happens out there is somehow subjective. That, that would render truth somehow a subjective concept. Uh, whereas truth should be about something objective that happens there out in the world. And now, uh, so this, this semantic side of the argument was made by Putnam in the 1960s. And this is further um, bolstered by truth-making semantics. For instance, Armstrong, who subscribes to eternalism or omnitemporalism, temporalism as he calls it. So what's the idea with the truth-maker semantics? So, for something to be true about the world, well, there has to be something uh, on the side of the world. Uh, what that exactly is, that's a matter of debate. A fact, state of fair, being, process, substance, some independently existing thing. And that makes uh, statements, claims, assertions, propositions, theories, this, uh, well, they make them true about uh, what, what was was what was stated. So if we have physical events like D, that event itself would be the truth maker for an existence claim like event D occurs at a given location in space time. And that truth maker should not depend on the contingent space time location in which the existent, existence claim is uttered. So we can say that these test, test locations they are perspectival, past, present, and future. They are frame relative, but the physical event itself is not. 
as like with the simple case, like let's say that TV turning on and that, that door opening, uh, if we are observers that we don't causally interact with these events, so it's not somehow that we create these events. They, these events just exist one definite way only. So they, they have the events have independent existence. Uh, okay, and here, uh, maybe a little more concrete example. So the event in question that let's make claim existence claim, existing claim, uh, sorry, existence claim about the first world war. So that there was these this soldiers they fought in this uh, significant massive war. And now according to eternalism, it doesn't matter what space time location we choose for the truth value of that statement. So it might be uh, here, I forgot, no, wait. This is the author of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley. Yeah. Mary Shelley, yes, would have been embarrassing if I forgot that, yeah. So Mary Shelley was compose, composing the Frankenstein in 1810s. So according to eternalism, if she makes a claim that there's a, a massive war in 1910s, that would have a definite truth value. Now, when we are here in this seminar, we make that claim in the same way it has a definite truth value. Well, the difference, of course, between these two is that Mary Shelley couldn't know because that would be uh, in her future, which is epistemically inaccessible uh, to her, basically because, uh, well, she couldn't see the future that would uh, turn around the, the causal asymmetry. But still, the principal point is that independently of the space-time location, uh, claims about events have a definite truth value. Now this, wait, that would be the last slide here. But here, um, when I mentioned the no notion of passage of time, so is it that events can, can somehow come into being? Well, uh, the kind of standard answer, if you take relativity seriously, well, there really cannot be passage of time at least not along the past, present, future axis. So here are some concrete examples about Finland. When in Finland, the spring comes, it's like it never comes. It takes so, so, so long. And here's like few uh, hints that, okay, the spring is finally coming, as we say with our language, with tense language, there's the common brimstone you can see and these crocus flowers somewhere in April at least in southern parts of Finland. So now uh, someone like Runbaum, who that's very much against the notion of passage of time, he would say that it's not like these events somehow objectively become. It's rather that we share same space-time location and there's a conscious being that becomes aware of these events. And that's when we say that something becomes, that's what, that's what it means to say that there is temporal becoming, but there isn't really any kind of objective becoming. It's not that events come into being and then fade away. Rather, all events exist. And this would be the last slide. Uh, okay, so if this eternalist picture, if that's if that is the case, so we have these events. They exist, they are spread across four dimensional space time. And these events themselves, they serve as truth measures for statements concerning. Them. And we have this, uh, I'm not a historian, so I, I couldn't tell how much this is a myth or how much this is based in history. But to my understanding, this is something that is not known that there was this peasant Lali who killed the Bishop Hendrik on, on ice in winter. Well, um, if we follow the, the, the eternalist doctrine and the, the uh, truth maker semantics that I talked about, well, this statement has 
this statement has a definite truth value one or zero. Uh, so the past event exists or does not exist. Well, exists in one, one way only. And if it doesn't exist, when it, then it just doesn't have a place in the four dimensional space time. So then that claim would be false. Uh, okay, well, that was uh, all I had to say. Great. Thank you, Matthias. Um, I suggest we'll first have a question from the room and I'll set up that online to speak again. Sure. And so does anybody immediately want to speak here? That's a common question, no, sir. I have two sets of questions at least, but I go with one only, and that has to do with the, the form of the argument for eternals to get a bit clearer on, the, on it. Um, beginning, I mean, I, I must admit that the eternalism is not very intuitive. So that means that uh, dinosaurs are roaming somewhere, Nazis are fighting somewhere, uh, I'm skiing somewhere, whilst we and all that. So it's a bit difficult to get head around. So therefore, I'm curious about the, uh, the, the sort of motivation still. And um, is, it, uh, is it too simplistic to say that the sort of fundamental reason to opt for eternalism is just physics, just what physics says, the most advanced physics says. And I have a follow-up and then get another point. Um, if that's the reason, is it uh, conceivable that that works in physics, but you would have a sort of emergentism, so in some other field, let's say historiography, Mm -hmm. You would have an own way of thinking of time and other matters. So where in one field, fine, it's not necessarily transferable to another field. Or maybe the more strongly put, um, there's no this form of reduction regarding mm -hmm. time in this case. Like um, sometimes it's said um, that while there is a quantum physics, if you want to uh, build a bridge, you don't necessarily use it, but you use the old physics, like Newtonian physics, you can make it with bridge. Mm -hmm. So that might be a bit cheap, but maybe something on that. And then the um, um, the the final point is because you mentioned the truth making theory. Um, because I, I get the point. If you have truth making theories, the the you know the um, future references. Maybe a problem, and that sort of seems to be. Modern. Sorry, one would be the problem, but if if you refer to future occasions, if you don't, yeah, think, sure. yes, if you don't yeah. think that they exist, or even the past, if you don't think that yeah. they exist, so I can see, because I understood that, that it brings a motivation to be an eternalist. But is that the the motivation that first you sort of come into truth maker theory, and because you are committed to truth maker theory, you um, like Armstrong, you uh, are then. Inclined to be uh, eternal. Okay, there's a bit of a many, many yeah. things. Thanks. There were many uh, <laughs> questions. So that's what the primary motivation for eternalism. Yeah, I, I think it would come from relativity. Um, look, look at special relativity, which is empirically very well corroborated. It's mm -hmm. like everywhere in like high energy physics, nuclear physics, there's all sorts of technical applications. You have time dilation and relativity of simultaneity is encoded in time dilation. Mm -hmm. And when you work out relativity of simultaneity, there's debate with all these things. So it's there's no like that everyone agrees. But well, I put up that one uh, maybe a little anecdotal statistics, but I think when you when you work that out, it's not it's very hard to find room for pessimism. So that's more typical of you in the philosophy of physics to be eternalist. Uh, and also in a more general sense that for presentism, it has to be this one privileged absolute time that exists. 
there is there seems to be very little room in physics. The, the one thing would be maybe about the more fundamental science or the most fundamental. I'm not sure what that would be, but there are some challenges from from quantum physics because there you can make the case that when you consider the the double slit experiment, showing photons and they they randomly pop up individually on the the photo screen, so you could make the case that then well the future is open and non-existent and it's a random fact where it will land on the on the screen and uh it's not so it's not clear how this relative and quantum thing how they match and at least not to me the one interpretation in quantum mechanics would be that the many worlds interpretation that that would go i think very well together with that eternalism but there are other options but yeah, yeah, I think the the, the physics is the, like the primary motivation. Why it's so difficult to imagine that? I think that some people say they can kind of conceive of four dimensional space time. But I don't believe that because then you should see the future also. You should you should see like this present and past and future. You should kind of in your mind see all those. Uh, there's a uh, in sci-fi there's in the, the movie made in black three there's one character who can see that so they can see like the baseball games 100 years ago that someone can see if you go to a planet that's 100 light years from us they could see the baseball game with telescopes but i don't believe you can see the future because how does the how does the causation in perception work <laughs> like you would have to turn it around then and like uh oh with god can see and that that would be the the older, like maybe more traditional, eternalism that you could find maybe in the medieval times, like yeah. yeah. But, but that's that's slightly different from the kind of this kind of B theoretic relativistic where you take the modern science into account. But, and then also, I think usually it's it's taken a big case that eternalism explains truth making better than presentism because. Well, if the past doesn't exist, then there's nothing that the statement corresponds to. That would be problematic. With future, I think necessarily not. So I read one paper recently that this author came up with probability theory to connect through the probabilities concerning future statements. And that seems very reasonable view to me. Like next week's lottery numbers, they don't exist now, but there's the probability and there's a randomness to it. And that, that might go together with some quantum mechanical interpretations. We have online now, but afterwards. Okay. Uh, Rao, online. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. You're next. Oh, uh, yes, that works. Uh, there you go. Um, well, well, thanks, thanks, Georg. Uh, thanks, uh, Matthias, for your talk. Um, uh, I, uh, I I would just me merely uh, want to add to hear maybe Matthias uh, what Matthias think about um, as uh, he mentioned at the beginning. He works uh, more with uh, the philosophy of time than philosophy of history, and I think our situation is usually the reverse. We work more with philosophy of history rather than uh, philosophy of time. So it's great to hear, uh, to have you here to, to, to be able to exchange some ideas and see uh, if we, if we uh, uh, can somehow manage to understand each other uh, better. And uh, I've been working on a mapping of the, of the a conceptual map of the discussions over historical, uh, historical realism or something like that. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's perfectly possible uh, if for an observer far enough from Earth somehow uh, that uh, this observer would be able to see World War II, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein or Socrates in, uh, yeah. in Viagra. Um, but uh, I had the feeling that the discussion around historians uh, has more to do, as you mentioned, with the perspectival nature of the frames of reference. and for more or less to speak uh all historians more or less share the same not the same not exactly the same but a close enough frame of reference so that their light comes into the future and the past uh will be more or less uh, uh 
closely related because we are all on Earth, subject to Earth's gravity, uh, and all, all these kinds of things. So I was wondering maybe if the discussion, if we couldn't uh, better understand the discussion, framing it as uh, more of an epistemo epistemological question than a metaphysical one, in the sense that, well, what's under discussion is precisely that we, well, perhaps uh, whether um, Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo has a truth value, of course, maybe it, it has a truth value, but whether we can or cannot uh, or whether, uh, assert these, these uh, just be justified in saying that Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo or not. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering about this connection between metaphysics and epistemology. And perhaps we could, uh, we could uh, comment, for example, on how uh, perhaps a, a physicist would treat a physical, a simple physical event, like, uh, oh, I was hit in the head by a rock. So um, certainly on an eternalist view, uh, it's a statement that has a truth value. Um, but in the present, what what uh, what we what justifies the the the, the statement uh, perhaps is not uh, the the fact that exists in the past, but rather the the signals we have in the present, like my my forehead is cut, I'm bleeding. Uh, there are uh, remains of rock uh, around the, the 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 injury and so on and so forth. Uh, so that that's one one. Uh, 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 one question where I would maybe uh, like to, 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 to hear you, uh, your thoughts on this connection between uh, metaphysics and epistemology that seems to be one of the knots of confusion in discussions over historical realism, which is which perhaps explain why you, you, uh, you couldn't find a theory of time uh, being worked out on, on these discussions. And uh, the second one, uh, just to finish, um, about uh, perhaps connected to the first, but uh, precisely about the the problem of truth making, um, and the connection between truth making and our epistemic uh, justification uh, for for certain statements about the past. In that, perhaps, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not a, a philosopher of time by any stretch of the imagination, but perhaps a. Uh, uh, presentist or at least uh, we could frame as as presentist a claim about a historian saying that well there's a causal reference from uh, a material that exists in the present so uh, Napoleon lost the battle of Waterloo well uh, all I have is is present evidence that these things happened but this this material is causally related to uh, in a chain of causal causal relations back to uh, whatever the event is. So even if the event doesn't exist anymore, uh, perhaps uh, uh, these causal causal uh, uh, causal relations, this causal understanding of reference, could uh, somehow uh, 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 start to give an answer to the problem of truth making. Uh, and and reference on, on past statements. Um, that those are the two main uh, main questions I, I I would have. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There was uh, uh, quite many points that you make. I I, I would guess I uh, like agree as much as I understood what you said. But so yeah, I mean that would be one thing like because I'm approaching this from like ontological and metaphysical point of view, but how about then the epistemic access and the more <laughs> you know, practical issues about knowing about the past. So I, uh, I agree completely that I don't give a proper account on that. And I was a little hesitant of whether I should come to this seminar and give a talk because I'm so much in the general and abstract end of the spectrum. So I cannot really give <laughs> Kind of any kind of practical hints as to you know how to better the epistemic access or what are the what are the main obstacles about knowing about the past and really not not uh, 
I haven't studied the historiography or, or, or so on. Um, it's it's rather when it comes to, uh, as I said in presentation, it's like a principal point when it comes to claims about the past. The past exists in one definite fixed way. It doesn't change. So then these claims have, have uh, yeah, definite truth values. And uh, it's uh, when I talk about this truth making theory, it's very much on the ontological side on the notion of truth. So it, truth doesn't depend on our epistemic practices according to this truth making view. <laughs> just, uh, uh, just one interjection. Uh, 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 I I think uh, it's great that you that you came here uh, because uh, precisely uh, I think philosophers of history tend to depart to depart from an epistemological uh, point of view and sometimes metaphysics comes uh, like hitchhiking uh, and uh, I think it can lead to some confusions. Uh, in this in this transit from one level to the other, so uh, I, I would thank you for <laughs> for coming for coming here. Thanks for your comments. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Joao. Uh, next is Barish, then it's knife, and uh, it's open again. Barish, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, that was really good for me. I just wanted to make a historical note right after you, Mati. Uh, as far as I remember, if I'm not wrong on it, uh, the first full-fledged exponent of uh, eternalism was Charles Howard Hinton, uh, the British mathematician. And uh, he, yeah, he, he had a book named uh, Fourth Dimension and published in uh, 1884. Mm -hmm. And and I think the, uh, the my point is if he or uh, if you are uh, you understand it you understand my point well if you are familiar with uh, Charles Howard Hinton. Uh, I think there is uh, 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 rather than practical, there is some uh, uh, mystical concern in the emergence of uh, this theory and Hinton even. Uh, developed some exercises to expand the perception of uh, fourth dimension in in his second book named New Era of Thought, New Era of Thought, um, uh, four years, four years after the, his first book. Uh, so my point is just this. Uh, Because uh, I, I've discerned that there, 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 there was no uh, historical references in your presentation. And just Can you please that, write it to me so I'll check that out? Because it's the yeah, first time I hear of it. Yeah. It's, it's, what, 1884 was the year. Yeah. The, uh -huh. the, 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 uh, yeah. Publication of his first book, the name Fourth Dimension. Yeah, I definitely check that out. Thank you. Okay, do you want to say more to this? Yes. Maybe we can go on. Okay, then our next is Knife Albit online, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you again for that talk. I think it's really valuable and uh, imperative uh, at this point, in my opinion. So, what, what I found interesting initially, just a couple of points, is that the dominance or emergence of presentism somewhat uh, coincides with the rejection or margin marginalization of speculative philosophy of history. Um, so if you look at the different uh, definitions of speculative philosophy of history, I think we'll kind of get an idea of how eternalism is somewhat compatible with speculative philosophy of history, and presentism somewhat uh, necessitates a rejection of speculative philosophy of history. So if you look at Walsh, um, he says speculative philosophers of history attempt to create a philosophical account of the totality of human history, and he also describes it as almost a metaphysics of history with predictive elements. And I think the second and perhaps the best definition of speculative philosophy of history, in my opinion, is by Avi Tucker. He says speculative philosophy of history 
presents a unifying descriptive model of what is assumed as the whole of significant history. That model explains historical change, which is the past, and the model is projected onto the future to suggest the meaning of history. And look at the third one by Gruner. He just um, speaks of three categories for defining a spe speculative philosophy of history. So the first is meaning, second is value, which are irrelevant to this uh, talk. But the third one is kind of relevant, which is pattern, which again, when you speak of patterns, you're suggesting uh, or you're accepting a past, present, future continuum. So, but not always, of course, not all speculative philosophies of, uh, of history need to have this, but this is the common, uh, um, um, most patterns that are um, introduced usually um, accept this past, present, future continuum. So that's one of the things I've noticed, but maybe my question would be, maybe eternalism or if, if there's any other model. Uh, so what is the position maybe of eternalism towards projection onto the future, prediction and speculation? Or if, or if there's any other um, position that kind of is compatible with this idea of projecting onto the future. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you so much. So uh, projecting onto the future. So you mean, do, do you have in mind, like, how do we know about the future? Was that the, as opposed to knowing about the past? I think for me, it's more of the, in the philosophy of history sense. So. Uh, ba so predicting the future based on past patterns or based on uh, the specific philosopher's um, idea or theory on history. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I guess uh, under eternalism, it would be when it comes to knowledge about the future where that couldn't be causal knowledge because causes perceive effects in time and there couldn't be any kind of uh, sensory knowledge about that about future so i guess it's some kind of practically some kind of prediction or guesswork that that is at play but then what the eternalist i assume what eternalist has to say is that like well next week's or this saturday's lottery the winning lottery numbers, they exist in one way. Well, who knows what they are? You have to guess. But, well, that would maybe render probability as our ignorance, not due to some kind of there not being future and future being open. And, and that might be, I don't work in the probability theory, but that might be one issue that can you kind of explain chance and probability can you probably explain them under the eternalist framework? Because eternalism is very much a deterministic theory. So I'm not, not sure if I could uh, adequately answer your question. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Naif. Um, okay, I am now in the room again. I would have a question, but I'm the moderator, so maybe, yeah, then you go first. Uh, yeah, please. I just there. Uh... Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I will later want to follow up with you. But um, just about uh, presentism, uh, these concepts are all new for me also. So so maybe I... So like, um, is there an idea how deep is the present? Like, you, you know, like when we talk about the, the moment, yeah, mm -hmm. then uh, like... How deep is this moment? We also heard about the kind of the epistemological kind of question here, like the stone hit my head and uh, it's still quite present. The stone is gone, but the pain is still there. Uh -huh. Like, I, it, it seems to me that, that these, um, these, that the present can be kind of, that it's not uniform, that, that it might be kind of, mm -hmm distributed in the hyperplane, like you would say, but the, there is a thickness to it, it maybe. So are you, talk, uh, are you asking about um, like how long is the now in our experience or? Maybe that, 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 that's how it could be framed as well. Yeah? yeah. How long is the moment in presentism? Uh, how long is well, the now? How deep is the now? Well, there's, I think the, uh, the, the ones who are in favor of the extended now, I think they usually the 
the figures go around half a, from half a second to 1.5 seconds. But then like William James had it for what, 12 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. So you have different est estimates of that. And then you have the, maybe it relates a little bit to, to your question as the, there's the doctrine that James came up with in like maybe late 19th century, early 20th, the notion, notion of the specious present. So the idea there is that you have this, this one present moment and in this present moment, you can kind of change your attention in, in that in what counts as present is that I'm like being aware and looking at this, this paper and then maybe at screen, is anyone asking a question? And that would be the present. And then you have different estimates of how, what is the stretch of that present moment. Uh, but then you, all, then you also have, these are all, all contested. You have uh, Walter Arstila, who's a, an expert in experience of time, subjective time works at the University of Turku. So he recently published a paper based on experiment of psychology where he contests the view that he says that there's no, no extended present, no subjective or objective way to, to say that the present like lasts a finite amount of duration. Yeah, I'm just like yeah. wondering really also like that the, the present is not only maybe a, a, there is not, it's not only a question of psychology, like it's also like a, a question of, embo of, of embodiment. Like there is also an embodied past, which is basically not something I, not a, a, a past I read about an account of like something, but, but the, the past inscribed itself onto my body. Like for example, the scar from the stone, which hit me 10 years ago and which still hurts when the weather is changing, like there is there is a present of the past here, but maybe I, I'm I'm mistaking here categories. But but well, if the, but that's one wonder like where where now where are though like the universe is hiding you very well. Where is the now? Why you cannot we? It's not in the laws of nature or structural space time. Where is the now? <laughs> like. One thing is also what one could say is like when you don't necessarily have to talk with past, present, and future, you would also use earlier and later. Mm. And they would have this kind of fixed, like it's always, always true that uh, Finland gains its independence before joining the European Union or something. It doesn't matter at what time you say that. And then this before later relation. You can apply that to, to causal sequences, and that would maybe have the kind of embodiment that you maybe kind of refer to. But this past, present, future, they are changing all the time. And uh, yeah, I, I find them more problematic, and that's the, the terminology in these debates A theory and B theory. A theory is sort of past, past, present, and future, they are what time is fundamentally about, that's structured like it's dynamic, and then there's B theory said. It's static, it's before after relations. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. Uh, so I, I would put that embodiment phenomenon more on the before after relations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, according to our rule, we would take online now. So I carry yours on the list, but let's first ask if online has a question. Nobody raised their hand at the moment, but is anybody first who wants to online? Um, did I something about something? Okay, no question, just thanks and greetings from Sami. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Sami. Okay, so I mean, I think I think online can think about it again, then you can go, Kari, first. Yeah, actually, I would like to comment partly on this. Uh, in my mind, Heidegger talked about time and history city, so that uh, actually present is always connected to past experiences like some trauma in, in our past and on the other hand to our future uh, projects or plans for future. So actually uh, the experience of now 
it's not real, it's always <laughs> connected uh, on the other hand to past and on the other hand to future projects. Maybe there is some uh, uh, Her Heraclitus uh, metaphysics background, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. is fluctuating mm -hmm. and therefore present moment is, is something irreal. Is this uh, actually externalism in some some, some kind of sense? <laughs> well, no, because eternalism would eternalists wouldn't say that the, the present doesn't exist. They would say it exists like all times exist. Yeah. So it's very realist theory about time. So all times exist. But uh, well, to me that sounds like a Kind of phenomenology of time or experience of time, like how these past, present, and future, how they kind of appear to us, and how we, with them, how we structure our lives, or that would be maybe the, the question. Yeah, or, it's uh, existentialism, actually. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, yes. Um, I, I would have a question too, but let's ask online. Shuao sure, wanted to um, so is it on, on this exactly? Maybe you can go first. Yeah, yeah, otherwise I'll... Yeah, you, you can go first, uh, Georg. Yeah, it's, uh... it, it, it's not very well for my question anyway. Let's see what we make out of it. Um, so I have a question on sort of, okay, I understand you're into the metaphysics of time and you're a mm -hmm. realist about all times. Mm -hmm. going crazy. But if I understand correctly, the metaphysics of time doesn't commit us to any, any kind of entities ontologically, right? It doesn't tell us in a sort of, um, pedestrian way of speaking, what there is, right? What kind of stuff there is? And that would be my first question. What does it commit us to? Because if the metaphysics of time, for instance, would be able to commit us to event ontology or to processes or whatever, then we could really get a purchase out of the his philosophy of historiography out of this, because it would tell us, okay, these things is something historians should be looking for. The epistemological problem stays the same, but this is um, my first question. Um, and the second question is, you were speaking about um, some eternalists, if I understood correctly, have still a probabilistic understanding of the true values about the future. Correct me if I have um, misstated. My point would that be, can we extend that to the past as well? Because that would fit very well to the epistemological condition in which the historian finds themselves. They have the evidence, if they have anything in, the, in their present, and by then they, they make propositions about the past, which are probable or not, likely, very likely, and if they're very, very likely, they're, very, they're probably true. Is that a way of catching it out? To me, the, uh, well, if I start with the second point, so that was not the eternal doctrine that uh, truth value is connected to probabilities. This was uh, one article I read that connected to quantum mechanics, and I said that this seemed to me like very reasonable mm -hmm. view to, to defend. That would be against eternalism. Uh, but to me, it sounds very weird that Concerning past, there could be probabilities because past is fixed and doesn't change. So, if there are probabilities, they would have to concern open, non existent future, it seems to me. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we will. Like the last week's winning lottery numbers, it's not probability, it's one definite thing, the row. But the future ones, they, that might be like an open. Like right. an issue of probability, I think. Even if you don't know the numbers. The but would you, would you, would you, I mean, it's a, it's a clumsy way of speaking, yeah. but would you say we could talk about the truth value probabilistic, or about the truth value, or about the proposition probabilistically? Yeah, if, right. if it concerns the future, but not the past. Oh, not the past. Okay, so we still got that issue. Okay, but we don't need to get into that. Um, and then it, it, it's not zero or one, but it's some, some it's a range. It's yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other question about what? What do you mean physical time? No, I, in terms of entities. Yeah, you know, I think it, well, okay, event is the the thing. <laughs> the, the, what would be the thing on the side of the world that substantively exists? Uh, but should I say more about what events are then? Uh, blah, blah, blah. That's a very difficult question. The plot of picture, hello. Unclarity what an event is. So if you can say something yeah. this from the yeah. of fact, and then, then I of course understand that now when when you get the history, there's a lot of like social construction, of course. Like if you have 
just a physical event that I don't know a tank shoots someone. But if, if it's is it a murder or a kill? If it happens in a war, it's neither like it's like a venerable thing to do. So that would kind of mess it up a little bit because it's there are these rules and laws that kind of created that thing. Um, but yeah, and then in, in physics, it's <laughs> what is said about events, they are infinitesimal points in space-time diagrams. <laughs> so they are they don't they are like highly, highly idealized. They don't really like give any content of what what, what these events are. But uh, yeah, again, again, staying on the very metaphysical level, it's events should be fundamental entities in the sense that when we talk about event, that has unconditional existence, but whether it's in the past, present, or future, that's perspectival matter. You know, one, one follow-up question. On that basic physics definition of events, could we say something like the first world war is an event? But the very complicated thing is what stuff happens, you know? Yeah, well... Like, I, it's considered by events, or sort of... Yeah, I, I had in mind that that's like a well, kind of clear example that you couldn't really deny because there's like, you know, flesh and blood and, and you know, shooting and crawling and all that stuff going on. And uh, the one thing with events usually is like, if you compare them to objects, the objects usually have, they have like um, stricter kind of boundaries, but with events you have, they're kind of loose, like when does it begin, when does it end? Like, like think of something like birthday party, does it begin from, Writing the invitation cards or first case coming, or when does it end? Is it like when the kid plays with toys, or like so? They are usually like vague on the on the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Many historical events are big, vague. Although, but we don't get that. A lot yeah. of people want to say something. I think Shuao is next. You want to begin the onimati, so Shuao next, please. Um. Uh. Thanks, Georg. Uh. Now, uh, it occurred to me a, a question that perhaps uh, it's it's more uh more uh circumscribed to, to metaphysics. Um, how, how does entropy uh, um, fits within an eternalist uh, 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 um, conception of time? Uh, in the sense that, well, uh, there's this sense that entropy is always increasing, uh, which would perhaps uh, explain why we can access, we, we, we uh, have this experience of, of going through time in one direction rather than the other um what what where where does entropy fit within uh, uh, uh what seems a very static uh picture of of of, of time yeah that, that's maybe one of the like core difficulties of, of eternalism that can you explain change if everything exists unconditionally uh usually i think one of the problem here is that well if, if you try to imagine like the four-dimensional block universe in the sense that you have a into a picture you have three-dimensional block it seems kind of static and then there's time that is external to it but this is not the case of course that would be the obsolete newtonian picture so what you have you have time like word lines which are the paths the observers traverse in space time. And there you would have the dynamic features, which I think, and this is what I talk in my book, that they would come from the causal asymmetry and the causation would be the dynamic part. And that's one candidate how to explain the direction of time, at least locally, not this one universal, unique direction of time, but these local directions would come by means of causal asymmetries. And that that's the, the one other option, at least macroscopically, as you mentioned, is that second law of thermodynamics. Um, I guess the candidates for direction of time necessarily don't depend on whether you are present or eternalist. They, they have to do with not necessarily the ontological commitment, but the direction of time, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a very similar point as what Pierre yeah. Uh, just says, but I, I reformulate and then I still have another if there's time. So if we accept the you know the existence of past or the pasts, so I think what you don't get if you try to apply to philosophy of history, 
what you what you get you don't get from the existence of the past to the ontology of history mm -hmm. ontology of history mm -hmm. yeah. and i think that that's the step that, that relating to the last slide mm -hmm. and um even if there is this past then if you take a look at the well let, let's take now the historiography you have a lot of historical entities postulated there so you have you have a uh, some people say there are narratives, even in the history. Uh, there are groups and there are societies and there are something called collegations as a period of the Renaissance and there are events and so on. Um, so that would be, I guess, where how you wouldn't get very easily to from the existence of the past to the ontology and to the realism there. Mm -hmm. And I am one who actually has argued by way of using truth maker theory that Regarding narratives, mm -hmm. truth maker theory gives you zero falsity. So it, it, I took it that it doesn't. <laughs> there are no narratives in the past because they would be constructed. So therefore, mm -hmm. even they were the truth bearers, they would not be truth makers. So I think that would be something that seems to be missing uh, to my mind. And then I add to that. Even this is indeed often that is also taken, I think, by historians, uh, by philosophy history as a sort of an unproblematical notion. But I'm not sure if it is even on the logic because it's, it's not, it's very difficult to define what an event is. And then if there's a fixity of event, that's even more difficult. And clearly there is, you know, something happening, but maybe you need to go all the way down to some kind of a causal mm -hmm. material movement interaction, because that, that is something that there is. But where do you draw the line of it? this is and even this is not then i'm not sure but then, anyway the ontology of the past uh, uh ontology of history history would be an issue yeah yeah i agree that like with the last slide it's that there's something missing it doesn't get the bridge or that it doesn't bridge the gap i meant to say um yeah just uh one thing in the more like if, if I try to think of like near past something like crime scene investigations and if there's a there's a body and evidently there's a murder and then you have these suspects and you make the claims that they committed the murder so it would seem to me that there's a definite truth value for these claims although there's some maybe qualifications as to because what counts as murder or kill or like there, there's some something that comes from our laws and uh, morality and something. So it wouldn't be just like discoveries, but but the intuition would be kind of realistic blind view about uh, like crime scene investigation that would be in the past. But I don't know that how how close like history and this crime scene investigation are to each other. I guess one one option is that you really um, uh, simplify language of historians or make it a very simple. You refer to a person A doing thing T, right. and that's it. But that's what would happen. That, that doesn't have, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of very reductive process, like yeah. you know, logical positivism. But that's just observation. Right. Then you might get closer. Yeah, yeah. something like that. So the outcome of a crime scene investigation is usually not something like Renaissance happened. Sorry? The, the outcome of a crime scene investigation usually not something like the Renaissance happened, which happened. You know, it's always the most simpler thing. Usually. It is, yeah, I agree with that. The examples I used, they are simple. <laughs> so. my, my final point is then another problem that I want to pose here is the <laughs> um, how to get from the sort of um, existence claim yeah. to the claim about descriptive capabilities. I mean, I'm not sure if that is actually made, but anyway, I, I, I see that there's still a lot of um, a lot of uh, distance. Because I could understand we could make um, Kantian claim that there is there's uh, there's the there's the world and she, um, mm -hmm. but of course it doesn't say anything that we have any way of describing it as historians. So we just accept that there is somewhere beyond transcendental world. Um, but perhaps more pointedly, I'd like to mention that Georg knows well the 
the idea of of the practice in history where you uh, need a retrospective perspective. So even if you were able to have this ideal chronicler, this one structure that he sees everything, mm -hmm. I guess in this case, in every past and all times, mm -hmm. the the argument is, I guess it's, it's still working in the present context, but even if you see everything that happens all the time, you are able to mm -hmm. record it in your book. Mm -hmm. You would not be able to write history because the claim is essentially history has a retrospective point of view. Mm -hmm. And so you can only describe it from the retrospective point of view. So and the, the classic example is the 30 years war. So when the 30 years war began, no one knew that it began. No one knew that there was going to be a threat. So it's only when you know someone decided to describe a gay and the 30 years war then. And that's the next. I had the same in mind, like with the Great War, First World War, and they didn't call it the, the First World War back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. But I guess uh, the final point, the Dante would say that uh, if uh, if you assume that this ideal chronicler, journalist, okay, is able to see the minds of all historians, all people all the time, uh -huh. then you would be able to see that someone, a historian, comes along and decides to our people, whoever it was, describe it as a 30 years. Is that right? But that Dante disallowed. He did he allowed he he allowed the knowledge of possibility. Yeah, he allowed knowledge of the future. That would be like the God's eye view. You see everything. You really the same have a like yes. This. Because then he would have outdone historians. But the whole point of the thought experiment is unless you know the future. So that would the, be a metaphysical question. Wouldn't it? That somebody that this Yeah. You even an ideal chronicle or godlike figure is able to see the minds of all people of all time. Therefore, he is able to know mm -hmm. history of all history of the time, all time. Mm -hmm. Outlandish claim. Mm -hmm. Yes, so very short then. Oh, so you please. Okay, and I want to talk about the relation between the prison, prison drama and the the external drama. Um, if we look at a clock, it, it, it's like a common sense to feel that the steady beat, a, re, a repetitive beat, mm -hmm. creates a sense of sameness across time. Mm -hmm. um, the steady beat uh, varies time, and uh, it generates the past and the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it, a repetitive beat, um, Give, give us uh, a feeling that the uh, present thing uh, exists is real. So mm -hmm. the the plastic is also real. So uh, and I kind of in this way, the external realm is based on the consensus of uh, presence present mm -hmm. This is the question. Uh, so the question that uh... So how much is presentism like included in eternalism? Was that uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, I guess with the uh, with the reality value tables, it's maybe the most most clear that when you compare the two two views, uh, you would ascribe zero reality values to past and future under presentism, and under eternalism, you would describe reality value to reality value to all events. But yeah, uh, not sure uh, how this relates to the example you talk about the clock and the yes. isochrony at the Pixar. They happen at uh, equal pace. That was something you had also in mind, or yeah, uh, yeah, or, or was it was it something like? Uh, what does make an accurate clock, or was it something like that? No. No, I just think the present give us a, a feeling that, like the clock is a steady, steady beat. Uh -huh. Yes, and the relative beat, beat creates a sense of sameness across time. Uh -huh. Oh, so it's the idea that if if there is presentism, how there how can there be any change if there's just one time or? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chris, a sense of sameness. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was, these are actually, that point was, I think these are really old arguments going back to 
like this Zeno and Parmenides and Heraclitus, they already had some, well, I mean, these guys, Parmenides and Zeno tried to say that motion is an illusion, but they already had something like, if you have like an arrow flying in the air, how can you explain motion if there's just the present time? Because then it's, okay, you, you pick, this is the steady, the still image, if, if this is what you have in mind. So you have the still image that not right now the arrow is here. Okay, if there's present time, there are no other times. So how could it move? Because if you move, you need like motion across space and time. So you need like all the space and all the time for there to be this, this motion. Right, I think I can give online and offline one more chance, maybe a final round, if, unless you want to go on. <laughs> but, but let's ask online first. Is there any question online still? I would be interested to know if uh, eternalism is coextensive with the law of the excluded middle, so it is more or less equivalent to a de determinate truth value for past, present, future, regardless. And if that's the case, is this relationship between eternalism and the law of the Nick, sorry, it, it muted again. Yep. Please, mute, please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was my. So rude. I want, no, <laughs> no, I want to make you big for our. Uh, class not, the, the question is too difficult. So. No, please. <laughs> we, we heard excluded middle. Please continue from there. My apologies. I, I, does does etern is eternalism coextensive with the application of the law of excluded middle to any time period, past, present, future? And yes. if if eternalism is coextensive with with uh, the law of the excluded middle, is that coextensivity uh, a function of some you know accident of the way the universe happens to be constituted, or is it is it just that eternalism is a relic of this logical presuppositions? And an alternative way to formulate that would be: Is there um, could you formulate internaliz eternalism in the context of, uh, say, an intuitionistic logic? Yeah, I think there's like, under eternalism, there are no genuine future contingents. So it's law of the excluded middle all the way. Uh, but then, um, as to your question, was it like, I'm not sure if I uh, understood it. Was it that how significant part of eternalism is the law of excluded middle, or how does it motivate it? Or yeah, how how are they related? If 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 these two are perfectly coextensive, if yes. eternalism corresponds with the, the law of the excluded middle, yes. is their coextensivity a function of the the structure of the universe, or is it just the fact that eternalism is a is a view on on time and history that that is a relic of this logical presupposition uh, yeah I, I assume that there under eternalism that it would it is very deterministic theory that there isn't then room for this kind of metaphysical vagueness and this kind of open possibilities but then i i don't think that that eternalism excludes freedom of the will in the sense that you can still say that later events as they are caused by earlier events the later times are, are partly as they are because of partly because what we do before those later times so something like uh what's the state of the, the environment in 2015 2050, that depends on what we do previously, what we do now, what kind of environmental policies we do right now. Um, but then there would be, under eternalism, a uh, definite fact about the, the average temperature in 2050s. I'm not sure if I answered <laughs> the, a, the big a slightly, problem. A slightly different way to come at it is, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, never mind. If I come, if I remember it, I'll ask. 
Thank you. A very, very good question. Hopefully, I can answer that adequately. Yeah, right. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's what holds everything together. Is it logic or is it some physical reality? Yeah. Maybe that was the question. Maybe not. Or maybe there's a good ending here. Um, or is there anything anymore in the room? Last time, last chance, online or offline? Is there any? David, did you just? No, he just showed his face. Okay. Any last, um, last chance? Okay, I guess no. Then I say thank you, first and yeah. foremost, to you, thank Matthias. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody online. Great to see all of you again. And as I said before, we'll reconvene on the 29th of April again with um, Taina Marino on uh, intergenerational justice and the ethics and history and something more that I currently kind of remember. I hope to see you all then to, again too. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Hey, great. Let's stop the recording.